we're right at the end where, uh, where Jesus, we have seen, beginning in Revelation 19, 11, Jesus Christ comes to set up the kingdom. We saw so many things. Jesus coming out of heaven, riding on the white horse, judging the world. Uh, he's, he's dealt with the beast and the false prophet. We saw in Revelation 24 through 6, we've seen the time of the kingdom and believers are ruling with Jesus Christ. So this morning, what we're going to do is stop for a minute because if you really look at it, all we saw, all that's really mentioned about the kingdom in Revelation 20 is verses 4, 5, and 6. And there's not a whole lot of information there. So what I thought would be a great idea is us to, to, to look at these verses, but then to go with the other places in the Bible that give us more information about what the kingdom's going to be like. It's a thousand-year reign with Jesus Christ on the earth. So we're going to raise some questions, look through there, see some things. And I think it'll be a lot of fun as we go through it to see how it fits together. So as we start, I want to remind you at Stillwater Bible, we, we encourage believers to dig the Word of God, to study it. We, we teach a method which is called observation, interpretation, application. We have this bookmark. I have a bunch of them out there. You can get there on the table. As you go out, you can get them. The, on one side, it just says, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a bookmark. But on the other side, it actually says observation, interpretation, and application. And it shows you that if you're, as you start Bible study, it says observation. It gives you the questions to ask. When you're looking at interpretation, it gives you what do you do about verbs? What about this? What about this? And then application, it tells you what do you do? How do you make application? So this is a great little card that you can just keep in your Bible uh, as you study. And so if you forget or if you're saying, I want to remember that observation, interpretation, application, you've got it right there. So they're on the table as you go out. When we, when we look at the Bible, see, we interp interpret the Bible from what we call historical, literal, grammatical interpretation, which means we look at the Bible historically, literally, the words mean certain things and, and, and how they fit together. So when we look in the book of Revelation and it says that he rules for a thousand years, we actually believe it means he rules for a thousand years, because that's what it says. And so some people don't hold to that, but we do, and we, we'll look at it more and more later. We're, so we're seeing this. We're seeing how the end times fit together. Over the months, we've been looking at the flow. And let me just remind you, of course, this is uh, the Old Testament. Here's Jesus coming. He died on the cross, paid for sins, and rose again. This is his first coming. His first coming, basically, to die. Then we're the church age. That's where we are now. That's Revelation, actually, chapters 2 and 3. Then there's the rapture, where Jesus Christ comes and gets the church, takes us out. That can be found in Revelation 4 and 5, how it fits together. And then there's this time period called the tribulation that after we're gone, now all of the believers in a moment of twinkle and eye will be taken off the face of the earth. After we're gone, there's going to be chaos in the whole world. There's going to ultimately be a ten, ten king federation, then a three king federation, and then one king, one man is going to rise to power and he becomes the ruler basically of the world. He makes a peace pact with the nation of Israel. When he makes that peace pact, it's for seven years. That's what begins the tribulation. Remember, the rapture does not begin the tribulation. The signing of the peace pact does. And that tribulation is a seven-year time period. This man comes in peace. It starts with peace, then it goes to war, then it goes to famine, then it goes to death. Halfway through the tribulation, we've been seeing the Antichrist. We call him the Antichrist. He's called the beast that comes out of the sea in the book of Revelation. He claims to be God. He puts an idol up in, t in the temple that looks like him and talks and moves and demands to be worshipped. And there's a person called the false prophet who demands everybody to be worship, to worship uh, the, the beast, and they take the mark of the beast to 666 here or there, and, and so there's, gonna, there's great stuff. And we have seen the judgments, so we've seen the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl judgments, we've seen all that through the book of Revelation. With At the end of this seven-year time period, Jesus Christ comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Revelation 19.11. He's coming back as the king, and we saw that. And, and then he sets up a kingdom, and in Revelation 20, verse Verses 4, 5, and 6. This is what we saw right before we started our Christmas messages. We saw this event where Jesus comes as the king. And as I said, there's not a lot there. It says the dragon is is put, uh, the devil, the dragon is put in a in a big hole for, and he's held there for a thousand years and then they rule and there's people sitting on thrones and, and then it says, and they will reign with Christ and of God and will reign with him for a thousand years. And that's all it says. And so we could say, well, in what about the kingdom? What's it going to be like? How's it going to be? How are these things, are, 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 they, are they going to flow together? How will they flow together? Well, we decided, I just thought it'd be a good idea to look at some questions. So here we're going to raise some questions this morning about the kingdom. And then we'll look at them from scripture, of course. It's like, what is the kingdom? How long is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? Why, why is this a literal kingdom? Who will be in the kingdom and who will not be in the kingdom? 
What will this kingdom be like? What will believers do in the kingdom? And how do we enter the kingdom? So these are a bunch of verses, I mean a bunch of questions that we've raised that we're going to talk about. And Revelation 20 doesn't give a whole lot of information, but there are places all over the scripture that give us uh, information about this time period called the kingdom. So let's just start and raise the very first question and we go, what is the kingdom? And people say, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is the time in God's plan that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will come to the earth and rule in righteousness and justice on the throne of David in, in Jerusalem, in Israel. And he's going to come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If we look at the chart, this, this is where we are now. There's going to be the rapture, then the tribulation, and then the second coming. And Jesus Christ is going to come, and he's actually going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. That's the kingdom. And so what exactly is the kingdom? Re Revelation 19.11, the heavens open and here comes Jesus Christ. Revelation 19.16, he's coming, it says on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so Jesus Christ is coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So when we say, what is the kingdom? That's that time period in which Jesus Christ rules on the earth as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You say, why, why do we have a kingdom? What's going on? Well, let's think back to the beginning. God actually created the heavens and earth in six days, and then he uh, had man, and he created man, which is ish, the Hebrew word for ish. He called him Adamah, which means dirt, and we say Adam. And then he created the woman Isha, which means out of man. Man is ish, Isha, and he created them and put them in the garden and said, this is the world. I want you to be fruitful and multiply and rule the world. You have dominion over the fish, over the, you have, you are the kings of the earth. And so what we realize is that Adam was the king of the world. He was supposed to rule the world and possess offspring and spread out and, spread and, and rule the world. Well, we know what happened, that Satan came and deceived Eve and, of course, tempted Adam. And Adam sinned knowingly and it, they got all messed up. They were not from the eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He came in and told them, made them doubt God's love and doubt God's word. And they fell. And when they fell, God removed them from the garden. But Satan became the king of the world may not realize that, but he's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the God of this age. He rules the world. That's why it's a fallen world. That's why it's so terrible. God not only cursed the world, and we'll talk more about that later, but he has allowed Satan to be the prince of the power of the air. You remember that when G Satan tempted Jesus, he took Jesus and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I will give these to you. He has, he has that. That's why it's a fallen world. We have a fallen world that is of influenced by Satan, and the fallen world influences us, our flesh. That's why it's, that's why it's what it is. And so uh, then what's going to be great is when Jesus Christ comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus is going to end the rule of Satan, and Jesus becomes the king of the world. So you understand it started Adam to be the king. He failed. Satan became the king. One day Jesus Christ is going to come as, as the, the last Adam. Think about it this way. The first Adam failed in the garden. The last Adam, Jesus, gained the victory. And he's going to come as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So when you say, what exactly is the kingdom? The kingdom is the time on earth when Jesus Christ, the son of God, the king of kings, rules the world in righteousness and justice. That's going to happen. The second question is, but how long is the kingdom? Well, obviously, if you've been here and we've been studying it, you understand that the kingdom is a thousand years long. That's what we realize. But if you look in the scripture, going all the way back to Adam and Eve and, the, and all the nations of the world be blessed, and then choosing uh, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and David, they're all looking forward to a kingdom coming. A kingdom is coming. Even the apostles, when Jesus died and rose again, got ready to go back to heaven. They said, is it now time you're going to restore the kingdom? And he says, no, it's not there. So how long is this kingdom? Up to this point, until the book of Revelation, we had no idea how long the kingdom would be. In the book of Revelation, we find that the kingdom is a thousand years long. Six times... In seven verses, he says a thousand years. Look at this right here. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. In verse 2, he says a thousand years. In verse 3, he says a thousand years. In verse 4, a thousand years. Verse 5, a thousand years. Verse 6, a thousand years. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are completed. So, so six times in seven verses, we find that the kingdom is a thousand years long. 
We did not know that until the book of Revelation was written, which was probably 95 uh, AD. That, and that's the first time we know the time of the kingdom. This, the third question is, where is this kingdom? Where is it going to be? This kingdom is going to be on this earth going to be on this earth. Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. Listen, when you think about it, we're already going to see in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we're going to see that God makes a new heavens and a new earth. That's after the kingdom. The kingdom time will be on this earth, this world. And Jesus will rule from Jerusalem. Look at this. It says, and many people will come and say, this is from Isaiah. Many people will come and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So this kingdom is going to be on this earth in Jerusalem. And so we see that a kingdom is the time in which the Jesus Christ comes and rules the earth. He will rule for a thousand years and it will be on this earth. Now, the earth is going to cha be changed. Uh, let me just give you a hint. When Jesus Christ comes back, he comes to the Mount of Olives, which is right outside Jerusalem. He left from the Mount of Olives when he ascended into heaven. He went that way. Zechariah says he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. And when he touches the Mount of Olives, the mountain splits in two and a valley forms. And it says that when he comes back, mountains are, are lowered and other things are raised up. The world is going to be different during the kingdom. We're going to see more and more. Here's the next question. Why is this a literal kingdom? Would it really be a literal kingdom? There are some people who say, it's not mean a literal kingdom. I mean, uh, it's just, it just means that God's going to be the king of the world. And some people don't hold, we, if you remember about several weeks ago, we showed you different views of the kingdom. Ours is called premillennial dispensational, meaning premillennial Jesus comes before the kingdom. He sets up the kingdom. There are some people who teach what they call amillennialism, which means no kingdom. And they say there'll never be a kingdom. When they look at the Bible, they say there is no kingdom. There is no rapture. There is no tribulation. There is no antichrist. There is no kingdom. Jesus just comes back and it's all over. That's what they teach. And so some people then raise the question, then why, why do we think it has to be a literal kingdom on this earth? Well, what we've already seen, it says Jesus is going to come and rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. So we think that is literal. But I want you to understand that God made promises. God promised a literal kingdom. And we saw this before Christmas. God promised to David he said, if you remember, David looked out one day and he saw that the tabernacle, this, this tent where God would dwell with his people, it was out there and it may have been bad weather. And David said, I live in a big house and God lives in a tent. I'm going to build a big house for God. And Nathan the prophet came and, he, and, and David said, I'm going to build a big house for God. And Nathan said, sounds good. And then Nathan went to sleep and God came to him in a dream and said, no, no, no. David is not going to build it. His son Solomon would build it. But you tell David, I've got something for him. And so when Nathan came back to David, he said, David, God says, you're not building the house, but God is going to give you a house. He's going to give you a kingdom. And here's what he told David. He said, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I, God, will raise up your descendant after you. Not descendants, descendant, one, after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. We're going to see in a little bit, because that's in the passage, that God said to David, you're going to have a descendant who will sit on the throne of Israel forever. Well, Solomon didn't sit on the throne forever, and Jeroboam didn't sit on the throne, Rehoboam didn't sit, none of them did. The only one that will sit on the throne of God forever is Jesus Christ. And look what he says. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. God promised to David that on the throne of David would be a descendant of David who is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and that he will rule forever. Listen, Jesus was called the son of David. If you read the scriptures, there are times when Jesus was on the earth and people would say, son of David, have mercy on us. Listen, do you remember the time Jesus was walking and there were these two blind guys? And so they said, what's going on? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. They knew who he was. They started shouting, son of David, have mercy on us. And they said, be quiet. Y'all be quiet. Don't bother him. And he heard it and he stopped. 
Because he knew if they were calling him son of David, that they knew he was the Messiah and the Savior of the world. And he went back to them and said, what do you want? And they said, we want to see. And he said, you can see. And they could see. See, they knew who he was. He's the son of David who sits on the throne. God made that promise to David that there would be a son sitting on that throne, and that's Jesus. Also, we saw this uh, before Christmas, a promise to Mary. God came to Mary, an angel came to Mary and told her and said, he will be great. You're going to have a son. He will be great. He'll be called the son of the most high. So you're going to have a boy who is God, the God man, Jesus Christ. And the Lord God will give him the throne of who? Of his father, David. He is a descendant of David. He will reign over the house of Jacob for how long? Forever. And his kingdom will have what? No end. This is a literal kingdom in which Jesus Christ will come and rule in righteousness and justice. God promised David, and he also promised Mary that the son would sit on David's throne. So why is it a literal kingdom? Because the promise to David, the promise to Mary, and other places as well talked about there's going to be a kingdom on this earth. Now here's the big question, and this is a, a good one. Who will be in the kingdom, and who will not be in the kingdom? And that's a big question. Uh, there may be some of you are sitting out there saying, I hope I'm in the kingdom. You hope you make it. Well, how do you get into the kingdom? We're going to talk about that. That's going to be the last question. But let's talk about who will be in the kingdom, who will not be in the kingdom. Simply put this way, who will be in the kingdom? All those, first of all, all those who had ever believed in Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Meaning, from the time before Jesus died on the cross to pay for sin, before the start of the church age, so to speak, all of those people, all the way up to then, anyone who had ever believed in, in the Messiah, who had believed that he would save them, and it always by faith, Abraham believed God and was granted to him for righteousness, all of the people in the Old Testament who believed in Jesus Christ or believed in the coming Messiah, that's another way to put it, uh, they, would, they would be saved. Uh, all those then who believe in the church age, that's us. Every one of us in this room who have believed in Jesus Christ, we will be in the kingdom. And those who have, who have believed in the tribulation, if you remember that there were a lot of people who believed in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. So let me just remind you that all of the Old Testament saints who are believers, they will be raised to go into the kingdom. The church, we've been raptured, we will come back to go into the kingdom. The believers who died in the tribulation, they didn't take the mark of the beast, they will go into the kingdom. And there will be some believers who did not die, and they will go into the kingdom. That's who's going to go into the kingdom. So let's think about the Old Testament believers. Let's think about them. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve and to Enoch and to Noah and to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and David and Daniel uh, and Solomon and Saul, even Saul, and, and uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. All of those people, they're going to all be in the kingdoms. They're, they're, their soul and spirit is with the Lord. Their bodies are in the ground right now. And when Jesus Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, notice this. At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands over the sons of your people, will rise. That's Michael, the archangel. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until now. That's the tribulation. And at that time, at the end of the tribulation, your people, Israel, who are found written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will come out. Those to everlasting life, these to everlasting life, and others to disgrace and contempt. At when Jesus comes as the king to set up the kingdom, the bodies of the Old Testament believers will be raised, and they will be changed, and they will go into the kingdom. What about us? Well, we were all, we raptured, Right? It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus will always be with the Lord. For us, the next event, Jesus is going to come in the clouds, and in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, boom, we're going to be gone, just like that. The bodies of the believers who have already died, they're coming back, their bodies will be raised. That's talking about the church. We're going to be changed, and we're going to all be with Jesus. Now, that we're going to be in the heavenly places. Then we're going to come with him. But notice this. It says, we are with Jesus when he comes. Watch. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, who followed him on white horses. That is us. If you remember in Revelation chapter 19, 
at where it says in verse 13, he says, he is clothed with robe, dipped with blood, and the name is the word of God. And then it says, and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's us. We're coming back with Jesus. Believers are coming back with Jesus, and that's the church basically coming. We're going to be with Jesus when he comes. So we've seen the Old Testament saints will be raised at the beginning of the kingdom. The church has already been raptured and will come back with Jesus to go into the kingdom. Then there'll be the tribulation saints. Who These people, and what, look, I want you to notice, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded. Now let me stop for a second and show you this verse because we read it so fast we miss something. The first part of the verse says, I saw thrones. John sees thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. Who is that? That's the Old Testament saints, and that's us. Then notice what else he says. And I saw souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, they had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's the people who died in the tribulation. There are going to be a huge number of believers get killed in the tribulation. So, so far, we've got the Old Testament believers going into the kingdom. We've got the church going into the kingdom. We've got, old, we've got tribulation believers who get killed going into the kingdom. There's something else that I mentioned a while ago. They're going to be, notice this, believers in the tribulation that were not killed will go into the kingdom. Now, do you understand that? That means they're going to be believers who don't take the mark of the beast, who run for their lives, who, who make it through, and Jesus comes back, and they're not killed, and they go into the kingdom. Now, I want you to think about something. The Old Testament saints go into the kingdom with glorified bodies. The church, us, we go into the kingdom with glorified bodies. The tribulation saints who get killed in the tribulation, they go into the church, uh, into the kingdom in glorified bodies. But these people who are believers, they don't get killed. They go into the kingdom in regular bodies like us. Now, that's strange. There's never been anything like that. There are going to be a whole number of people, Old Testament saints, church age people, tribulation saints, all of us in glorified bodies. That means we won't sin. The flesh is gone. We get to serve God. And then there's going to be people who made it through the tribulation in bodies just like this. They have a natural bent, still have a natural bent to sin. And they're going to produce children during the thousand years. And you might say, well, how do we know that? How, how do we know that? Well... At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be loosed and he brings together unbelievers against Jesus. Well, where do these unbelievers come from? They come from the, they've come from the children, basically they come from, they're the children of those who made it into the kingdom and produced. Because see, for a thousand years, they're going to be people in regular bodies producing children. And these people are, many of them are going to reject Jesus Christ. Now, let me just say something that sounds weird. Here is Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, ruling the world, and there'll be people born who reject him as Savior and Messiah. They reject him. And you say, how do they do that? Well, it, all the way through history, regardless of how God deals with mankind, whether it's under the law or under the grace or church age or tribulation, there are always those who reject and those who believe. And let me tell you that it, it's, going to, it's going to be so many people, it's going to surprise you. Look at this. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations, which are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. This is called the second battle of Gog and Magog. And he gathers together to gather them together for the war. And look who it is. The number of them is like what? The sand of the seashore? Do you realize that at the end of the kingdom, Satan will be loosed, he gathers together unbelievers, and they come to attack Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's not a few people, it's the sand of the seashore. Now, where do these people come from? They're the children, they're the offspring of those people who made it through the kingdom, made it through the tribulation without being killed. They have normal bodies, and that's where these children come from. What's, what's, what's it going to be like? Well, Jesus will be ruling. Listen to this. 
Blessed and holy is one who has part of the first resurrection over the second death has no power. There will be priest of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So Jesus will be ruling. Now look at this. You're going to love this. David will rule under Jesus. Now this is called the throne of David, right? Jesus takes the throne of David. Well, what happened to David? David is going to rule under Jesus in Jerusalem. Look at this. My servant David will be king over them, over Israel. They will all have one shepherd. They will walk in my ordinances, and they keep my statutes and observe them. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, that they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. And those are all talking about the kingdom passages. David will come under Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. So picture this. Jesus is the king of the world, ruling from Jerusalem. King David rules over the nation of Israel. And there's more. Look at this. The 12 apostles will rule over the Jewish people. The Jewish people are going to be divided into 12 groups. And Jesus, the apostles will rule over them. Look at this. This is Jesus speaking. You are the ones who stood by me in my trials, just as my Father has granted me the kingdom. I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So you got Jesus as the king, David under that, the 12 apostles ruling uh, the, the nation of Israel. Wow, then all the other believers. Where are you going to be? We don't know. Maybe Oklahoma, right? In this world, think about it. If Jesus is in Jerusalem and David is in Jerusalem and the Jews are in Jerusalem area, uh, in Israel area, where will you be? You'll be most likely where you want to be. But you may say, I want, to go, I want to live where I used to live. I want to go back there. And what will you be doing? We're going to talk later. You'll get to serve him. But it's going to be based on how you served him here. You'll have opportunities to rule. And we'll see that as well. Now, here's the next question. Who's not going to be in the kingdom? Well, the beast and the false prophet, we've seen they've already been cast. Before the kingdom starts, they've been cast into the lake of fire. Already. Already. And Satan is bound. And then all the unbelievers who at the start of the kingdom will be put to death. Satan is bound in the abyss. Unbelievers will be killed when Jesus comes. Notice. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And the birds were filled with their flesh. Whoa. So, amazing. Jesus is the king, David under him, the 12 apostles over Israel, and then the rest of us in opportunities and responsibilities to serve all throughout the world. Who won't be there? The beast, the false prophet, Satan will be bound, unbelievers will be put to death. It's called, by the way, it's called the, the, the judgment of the sheep and the goats, as found in Matthew 24, 25, if you want to look at that. Okay, now, here's the question, and we've got to go fast. What will this kingdom be like? Look, earth's going to be different. It's going to be totally different. We think about our world. There's no more curse. Remember, the world was cursed. Listen to this. Romans 8. The creation itself will be set free from the slavery to the corruption and the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation right now, what is it doing? Groans and suffers the pains of childbirth. But the earth is cursed. It is. It's a fallen world. Do you remember when the garden, when God gave the instructions, he said that the, the world will be cursed and thorns and thistles will grow up and it's a fallen world. But look what happens during the kingdom. Animals will be together. People will be together. Look, the wolf will, lie, will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the young lions and the fatted steer will be together. A little boy will lead them. Cows and bears will eat together. A young will lie down together. A lion will eat straw. A nursing child can play by the hole of a cobra and a weaned child by a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. When the kingdom comes, animals won't eat each other. Before the fall, animals didn't eat each other. There wasn't death before the fall. That's one thing you got to remember when you want to try to go back and say, oh, yeah, there were dinosaurs and they killed each other. And they each other. Listen, there wasn't any death until Adam and Eve sinned. There wasn't animals eating each other. And in the, gar and in the kingdom, there won't be animals eating each other. The capital of the world is going to be at Jerusalem. There will be no war. He will judge between the nations and mediate, and I'll get to the very end. They'll, they will never learn war. They're not going to fight. They're not going to have war. Jesus rules with a rod of iron. Look at this right here. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So that's the kingdom. That's what it looked like. What's the next question? What will we do? Guess what we do? We get to serve him. 
just like we get to do here. And it's going to be based on our faithfulness. And because of time, I just want to put these up. The Old Testament saints in Daniel 12, 2 says, those that have been righteously will get to shine as lights. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, for all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded for the things we've done. Listen, if you're faithful, if you're faithful now, you'll get to serve and be faithful then. When you stand before Jesus Christ, what do you want to hear him say? Well done, what? Good and faithful servant. If, you're sa- if we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, we're going to have great places to serve during the kingdom. And then the tribulation saints, the revelation says, they were faithful, they got to rule with Jesus Christ. So that gives us to the last question. That's how do you enter the kingdom? Faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. That's how, that's how you enter the kingdom. It's the same way from Adam and Eve all the way up. It's always faith. The only way to be with Jesus in the kingdom is by believing in him for eternal life. Jesus died and rose again, paying for sin, conquering death. All who believe in him have eternal life. John three sixteen. God so loved the world, that's us, that he gave his only begotten son to die and rise again, that whoever, anyone, would believe in him, it's not works, it's faith, will never perish, but what's the promise? Have eternal life. Life. The message, he died and rose again. The response is to believe, and the offer is eternal life. Jesus Christ is offering every person the gift of eternal life, which comes by faith, not works, simply by faith alone. Let me end with this part right here. We talk about the first resurrection, which is Jesus, the church, the Old Testament saints, tribulation saints. Then there's the kingdom. And then there's what's called the second resurrection, the unbelievers. I just wanted to put it up. Jesus Christ is the first to rise from the dead. Then the church, then the Old Testament, tribulation saints. We go into the kingdom after the thousand years is what's called the second resurrection, the resurrection of death. And that's what's coming. We're going to see more details on that when we uh, finish and keep going through Revelation. So let me give you two quick applications. One is this. Let's realize that Jesus Christ will rule the world from Jerusalem as the king of kings. It'll be a new world. Animals will be different. Everything will be different. Believers will serve. It'll all be based on faithfulness. It'll be for a thousand years. There'll be the Old Testament saints, the church, the tribulation saints, both living and dead. There'll be the two witnesses. There'll be the 144,000 Jews. All of that's going to be in the kingdom. And our service will be based on how we served him here. That's what it's going to be. And, and there are going to be people in the kingdom who have normal bodies, who, create, who produce children, and those children are going to grow up, and many of those children will not believe in Christ for eternal life. It's just the most amazing thing. But that's going to happen. And so realize Jesus is the king of the world. The second thing is, let's, let us believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life to be in the kingdom. I hope and pray that every one of you in this room, if somebody said to you, if you were to die, would you go to heaven? You would say, yes, I know because I have believed in Christ and he has given me the gift of eternal life. I hope every one of you in this room would say that. We all know that we talk to people and we say, if you were to die, would you go to heaven? And they go, I hope so. I don't know. Listen, when you believe in Jesus Christ, what does he give you? The exact moment you believe, what does he give you? Eternal life, and you're saved, and you're saved forever, and you can know it. And how do you get into the kingdom? You get into the kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. 